please welcome Jacqueline McLeod. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, it's a really great pleasure to be able to speak to you. I've been enjoying the last week having a class with uh, some fantastic students, and I hope that they also have enjoyed it. But it's been really lovely to interact with some of you on, a, on an individual basis as well as uh, collectively. So what I'm going to do this morning, though, is to tell you a bit more about resilience. You'll hear a lot about it in you know, different news and in frameworks, sustainable development goals, many places people talk about it. But what I'm going to try and answer is, well, what is it? What is it to be actively resilient? Or how do you reactivate resilience? Um, because it's pretty clear that we're going to need it in the future when the climate changes, but also when the whole of society is to change as well. So I just want to reflect a little bit on the fact that I'm here standing here with um, the, the funding from Zurich, which is a clearly coming from the risk area. It's an insurance uh, entity, reinsurance, the whole idea of risk. And up until probably the last 10 years, it's been the case that our lives have been driven very much by risk, you know, understanding all these like the likelihood of unlikely events, what we would do in the face of disasters. And in fact, every day when you go out, you're looking at your insurance premium. We might not look at it explicitly, but you're living through your insurance premiums, car accidents, um, all sorts of things, personal liability, and so on and so forth. I'm sure the university administration is very aware of their insurance premiums. Yes, yeah, probably pretty high. Uh, and then, you know, you have, for example, a big event, as you've had recently with the, with the landslides, the mudslides, the rain, the, the fires, and so on. And as, I, as far as I can tell, there was a moment when the university campus was sort of isolated and people couldn't get here and the electricity was down and all that sort of thing. So each and every one of those elements would probably have an insurance premium associated with it. But the question is, can you go back and rethink what it looks like? Because they're all interconnected. And that's essentially what resilience is about. Now, that's not to say that the risk industry should just be sort of put to bed. That is absolutely not the case. You will still, I'm afraid, need, in a very litigious society probably like here, you'll probably need to feel confident that if somebody hits your car, it's not got to do with resilience. It's probably got to do with the guy is falling asleep or somebody, you know, uh, sort of had made a, made a catastrophic decision. So as far as I can see, there is still a place for risk-based approaches, but it's not going to be nearly enough as we go forward in such a, an uncertain set of uh, circumstances. And certainly for the chemicals industry, there is a whole world of what we would call hazards. And, you know, there's a, there's a general allergic reaction to chemicals, I would say, in society at large, not recognizing how much we depend upon chemicals. But there is an essence in which our world is changed even there from the simple kind of laboratory analyses that have been done in the past, which talk about how poisonous, how hazardous a particular chemical is, and it's usually about your exposure. But from the research literature we know, and particularly in Europe, we've become very policy oriented towards that, that the low dose long exposure is actually almost more important. In other words, tiny amounts, but given over a lifetime, or certainly during the course of a child's lifetime, is very, very critical. And I'll come back to that because it's, there's a flip side to this. There are things that you need to put into a child's diet at very, very low doses, which eventually set them onto a course with good cognitive development. So hazards are also something that one needs to pay attention to. But here, the time dimension is really important. And also your spatial contact, your, your daily contact with them. And so when we, do, when we see risk assessments, sometimes these elements aren't quite as well worked out as they should be. But what I'm going to think about with you today is resilience. So this is taking a step back, looking at the whole system, looking at how communities and individuals deal with disasters, with disturbance, with surprise, not just climate change, but many other things that come along. There's been a long history, very much driven by uh, American scientists, Buzz Holling and others, um, coming from the 1980s, where they picked up on dynamical systems and started to think about feedback loops and how that would change the biophysical nature. And there was, at one moment, a kind of big conversation within the conservation world about, well, could you bring ecosystems back to the place where they were? Having perturbed them, was it the right thing to do, in a sense, to reconstitute them? So many, many decades of work 
was done. Um, David Tillman's work, I think, was cited a lot in that. Uh, you know, can you recreate ecosystems as they have been and should they be? And it became, in a way, a moral discussion as much as a scientific discussion, because, in a sense, if the world is evolving forwards, is it appropriate to try to refit yourself back into the past? Now, until climate change has really been rooted into people's thinking, I would say that many conservationists, particularly in Africa, have this idealized view of being able to re reinstate the savanna, reinstate the tropical rainforests. Um, but you know, far be it from me to be critical of all that wonderful work. However, it is very obvious with climate change that this is going to become mission impossible, that you really cannot reconstitute. And so, yes, we are going to be faced with, I will call it geoengineering, but it is engineering of the biosphere in the face of very, very significant changes in climate. So we can have an opportunity to build resilience in right from the very beginning, if we understand what it means. And then another group, uh, again dominated, I would say, mostly by the Europeans, Karl Volker and others, started to think about socio-ecological resilience. Understanding, of course, that humans are deeply embedded, particularly in certain countries, in nature, and that therefore their actions, their adaptation, their abilities to influence pathways in the future are as important as the ecosystem, the ecological change itself. So there are, there's a lot of literature on that. And so what you see on the right-hand side is a very, very simple, to begin with, diagrammatic version of how you might essentially start to evolve, then you have rapid change, then it slows down, and you can almost imagine going through a threshold, and the question is, do you end back where you started? What Buzz Holling and Gunderson and others did was they said, well, no, actually, there's fast change, there's sort of medium pace change, and there's slow change. And sometimes the slow changes constrain the upward movements of rapid change. But also, you can experience and see that rapid change can sometimes escalate rapidly through these in interconnected systems and particularly those that are dominated by humans. So the question really becomes, when you're thinking of resilience, you can't just focus on one level. You can't just focus at one scale. You really have to understand how all these different scales are interconnected. Now, one of those um, elements of that, of course, is people. And people also have to develop resilience. And there's an enormous industry out there. I'm sure many of you will have seen it. You know, well-being, resilience, build up this, build up that. Mathematical resilience, even. Never thought of I'd ever read about mathematical resilience, but anyway. Um, and it's, it's really important that you, uh, when you're thinking about resilience in the broader context, that you take yourselves into the same thinking. And I'll come back to this, but some of the hallmarks of personal resilience have to do with a much more community-based approach to the world than the singularity and the individual pathways that many of us are kind of, I wouldn't say forced to follow, but you know, you, you find yourself on the, on the train tracks and it's all about me, 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 me. How am I going to get better than the next one, the next one, the next one? Well, I can tell you that a lot of work done in the 80s by uh, quite a famous uh, physician, Michael Marmot, he did something called the White Horse Study, and he was extremely interested in status and how it affected health, particularly longevity, because it would appear that as you take GDP into account, it begins to flatten off. So no matter how much more money you have, you actually don't live much longer. So he asked the question, of course, this is back in the 80s, before we really had a lot more of a, the genome under our, under our sort of grip. And he found, very interestingly, that People within Whitehall, civil servants, who are relatively well off, they became obsessed almost with the salami slicing of the person almost sitting next door to them. They were much more concerned with the person who was closest to them in social strata and in economic um, uh, sort of well-being than they were, in fact, with the top and the bottom. So. Uh, independently, I would say, he found the seeds of inequality. Because, and it's, and it's proving to be true more and more, particularly in very unequal societies, that mostly those individuals who are the, the greatest, the affected the most, are far less worried about the ones that are a long, long way away in terms of wealth than the ones who are closest to them. So you know what you're, you know about your neighbors, you know about your colleagues, you know about your peer group. And that obsession with knowing that group and not worrying about the ends 
the sort of the long tail, so to speak, is in effect a very dangerous a very dangerous situation because you, you basically lose control of the overall wealth of a nation. And that's why resilience is very important because it brings you back all the time to the community, to all the others that you interact with, the social networks, but also how wealth is circulated in society. And that's why you see in many books, when they talk about resilience, they talk about generosity and honesty, ethics, and, and many other things that have to do with more personal motivation. So. I'm going to sort of leap forward now to the last few years, last two or three years, where resilience became a kind of leitmotif for the Sustainable Development Goals. And it's really fascinating because if you go and read the texts of all these goals, you'll see either in the goals or in the targets, not in the indicators, but certainly in the targets, that the word resilience is used. But it is used in many different forms. So uh, if I think about, for example, goal one, ending poverty, one of the targets says, build the resilience of the poor. Now, what does that actually mean, build the resilience of the poor? Hmm. Uh, goal two, implement resilient agricultural practices. Again, something probably quite different from building the resilience of the poor. And in fact, when we look year by year at the UN Secretary General's report, inevitably, the word resilience will come up, and in this particular case, build the resilience of those individuals still living in extreme poverty, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And then stronger efforts are needed to build resilience and limit climate-related hazards and natural disasters. So it's everywhere. And if you look at the ontology of resilience, it's very, very difficult to define, apart from the ability to withstand shocks but it doesn't really talk about whether you re always return to where you were. So there's a kind of enigma there. When we're talking about building the resilience of the poor, are we saying that we want to trap them in poverty? We want to keep them there so they continue to be resilient? To I don't think so. But anyway, th so again, it's, it's a tautology. It's a very deep ontology um, uh, challenge. And yet somehow we kind of understand what it means but it is genuinely clear that when you translate the word resilient and you try to translate it, for example, into all the UN languages, it's rather difficult. There isn't a very succinct word of resilience in many of the other languages, particularly in Arabic and certainly not in Russian. So resilient infrastructure, well, I think a lot of us and a lot of you would understand what that means. The house doesn't get burnt down in a fire. Um, if it gets flooded, it's possible to sort of get it operational very quickly. Um, Resilient infrastructure, particularly over borders, very important politically, of course. You know, if you've got a bridge that crosses a very, very large estuary and one end is and isn't, and then you have problems. Um, making cities resilient, strengthening resilience in terms of climate change, and then conserving the use of resources in the oceans, including by strengthening their resilience. So I ask many of you, because some of you are marine scientists, what do you think that means when it comes to the marine ecosystem and oceans? Do, do we have a clear understanding of what it looks like to have a resilient ocean? OK, so I, I sort of put the challenge up for you. <clears throat> where, where I think we've got to is that inevitably, even if it's the oceans, we understand that there's a human impact. So we are genuinely dealing with socio-ecological resilience. And whether it's reactivating or activating, I think, is a, a contextual issue that one could come back to. So these sort of different elements to do with the sort of the local ecosystem and then the larger, broader landscape or seascape and then the, the more of the global dimension and somehow how that's connected then to management practices, how it then looks at institutions and, and ultimately how networks help to bring that together is really at the core of resilience. So going through the literature and going through praxis and talking to many people, it's getting clearer and clearer that there are at least seven principles that one would want to look at when you set out to describe, plan, manage, build resilience. So <clears throat> there's been a long, long field of work, field of research in uh, biodiversity and whether or not Sustaining biodiversity actually helps to conserve ecosystems and you know, make them more resilient. And whether you should have redundancy and, and do you have you know, uh, keystone species and so on and so forth. All familiar territory, I'm sure, to most of you. Um, 
there is an interesting mathematical theorem, I have to tell you, though, which Bob May and, and I and some others worked on, which shows it's, a, it's part of a Green's function. And it's, it's very interesting because up to a certain point is what you would conclude from this mathematical uh, uh, treatise. So diversity up to a certain point. Not infinite biodiversity, but a certain amount. Now, what is that point, of course, to be determined? And it's determined by different, what we would call natural length scales. So those can be time and spatial scales. So there comes a point where it's very burdensome, theoretically speaking, to carry lots and lots of species through suboptimal conditions. And you can, you can really look at that. Managing and enhancing connectivity, I think that's is very, very much, I would say, influenced by network theory. Uh, there's a lot of, um, I would say, abstract underpinning and understanding of what that looks like. And it is certainly one of the drivers between now and, let's say, uh, the next 10 years about how we will build the future internet capabilities, how we'll build connectivity and social communications. So you can have very brittle communications, you can have very flexible communications. Each of those have benefits and also downsides in terms of how much energy you've got to put in to maintain them. But it is clear that you need to find the right level of connectivity when you're talking about resilience. Managing slow variables and feedbacks. Well, this is the kind of hidden difficulty. It's very easy to become preoccupied with the local issue, you know, fire, rain, floods, you know, you can, you can really sort of say, right, we're going to look at this, we're going to recreate these uh, environments, we're going to make sure that people live healthily and safely and so on. And then, as, uh, without me having to quote the unknown unknowns, they sort of come in from right side. And those are probably slow variables. Now, what comes to our rescue uh, are more and more data flows coming in from some of our latest satellites. So I do a lot of work with the, the latest generation of Earth observation uh, platforms called Sentinels. Some of you might have heard of those. And they go along with a whole group of science exploration platforms, um, the Earth Explorers. So they, we can now manage to measure incredible things about planet Earth, which we never could before. I'll give you an example. There's a swarm mission, which uh, has just started to send data back. And it looks at the magnetosphere. But what it actually tells you is about the long-term history. And for the very first time, we can almost sort of look into the core of planet Earth. It's quite extraordinary data. Um, and again, it requires a very specialized knowledge to be able to interpret it. But the mere fact that we can look at that long history through the geology and then understand more about solar flaring and solar energy is very, very likely to yield some insights into what lies ahead of us. Then there's Aeolus, uh, a fantastic mission. It was so far beyond anyone's comprehension that you wonder how it even got through the mission approval. <laughs> and, and yet it did. And it was a, a blind faith between industry and science that we were going to somehow figure this out. And it's a blend of LIDAR and other instruments to be able to measure wind, wind speeds. So we will have the most accurate measures of wind speeds across oceans in our hands. It's launched in the third quarter of this year. And then we have all the Sentinel missions coming in. Uh, it was a huge wake-up call when we turned on Sentinel-5P, the precursor. And I mentioned uh, to a few industry people, yeah, well, of course, you won't be able to send out your emission reports anymore. Those are no longer inventories. These are real observations. And they said, no, 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 this can never be. I said, no, 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 we can see. We can see your factory. We can see the emissions from your individual factory. And I imagine that they blanched and then went home and thought, oh, my goodness. So the whole world of reconnaissance, of Earth exploration, being able to detect these very rapid changes and put them into the context of long-term change is, so to speak, upon us. It is petabytes of data, that's for sure. So we will need to develop much better ways of you know, extracting the data and understanding the signals. But the potential to understand those slow variables, I think we are now the generation that will have that capacity, which is really quite extraordinary. So wonderful people want to go to Mars, but frankly, I want to study Earth. I want to be here on Earth figuring out what on Earth is going on. Um, fostering complex adaptive systems thinking. Whoa. 
we all live really complicated lives, complex lives, and yet we manage it almost seamlessly. You know, you, when you think about all the tasks you achieve in a day and all the things you depend upon, particularly in a very sophisticated society like here, that things will be delivered at the right time and, you know, the food was cropped at the right time, etc., etc. Part of it is entrainment by ourselves, but the other part is that there's an enormous kind of redundancy and a choice level, which really you are privileged to experience here. That level of choice just simply doesn't exist elsewhere. And I am going to make a proposal to you that it is that choice that actually makes you less resilient. It's harder to adapt to because you become reliant on small parts of the network which you're unaware of. And when that goes and things start to collapse, it actually comes as a great shock to individuals. And I'll explain what I mean a bit, a bit further on. Uh, encouraging learning and anticipation. Uh, something that we tend to not teach our children is to learn how to anticipate. We'd rather they lived in the book, in the world as it is known, and not try to stray out too far. But of course, anticipating the, the, the unexpected is probably one of the greatest life skills you can have. Broadening participation. Uh, if any of you have worked in Scandinavia, you know you cannot have any decision made without the unions in the room, the staff in the room, the students in the room, citizens locally in the room, and so on. And it takes a very long time, even to make a simple decision. However, when everyone leaves the room, there is a kind of sense of, well, okay, I feel empowered and legitimized. I can now go out and, and say something about these kinds of decisions. So there are, there are trade-offs between moving quickly and taking time. And they always say in Africa, if you want to move fit quickly, go on your own. If you want to go a long way, take everybody with you. And, and I think that's really a very deep and, and nice, uh, stay, nice saying. Um, and then finally, promoting polycentric governance. It's a given here. You have it. I mean, you have county level, you have state level, you have federal level. But this is not a given in many parts of the world. However, there are traditional polycentric governance systems which work extremely well and are showing themselves to be extremely resilient in the face of all kinds of both social and natural disasters. So those are the hallmarks of what I would call um, resilience. So now let's step into the real world and, and see what we're really confronted with. So the last couple of years have been the hottest on record. We've had the highest sea level recordings. Um, it has become unbearable uh, for some animals, unable to survive where they have. Their ranges have been um, really extremely um, uh, curtailed. Uh, we've had the lowest levels of sea ice on record. We've had the largest humanitarian crisis, and we've got many heat waves going on around the world. So it's a, it, they've been years of superlatives, not necessarily the ones that we want. Here, of course, you've had fires and landslides, and in East Africa, we've been confronting droughts. Now, these droughts, just as an aside, are slightly weird because they're coming at times when we shouldn't really have droughts, even with an El Nino, uh, and then they're interspersed with a bit of rain, and then a drought, and then rain. And that's almost worse than when you have intense rain, long period, intense rain. Because clearly, the plants react in very different ways. And I'll tell you a bit more about how at least the, the wildlife and, and the, um, uh, the plant life is responding. Some of the short-term responses, um, I've been reading obviously a lot here about people, even though you all know about fires and, and landslides and so on, you know, more effective governance, raising awareness, surveillance, all the usual things, access to emergency responses um, and rehabilitation programs. Almost exactly the same conversation in every disaster you go to. So you could pretty much find the same things happening in Africa. You could certainly find them in conflict zones. So wherever things are going wrong, there's a call for governance, there's a call for raising awareness, and then there's a call to improve you know, the pickup at the end. So resilience, in, in a way, has got to anticipate all of this. Well, why didn't we have the governance in place? How come people didn't know? Were we not giving them right information? And why don't we have systems in place for the recovery? So you know, we should not really be caught unawares by many of the things that happen. So looking into the future. Highly uncertain areas are going to come at us, but there are things that we can already think of needing in our, in our repertoire. So we're going to want to have, for example, resilient infrastructure. 
And we can see already, this isn't just in the, in the textbooks of architects, but this is happening in reality, vertical gardening, where we see a lot of faces of buildings now being used for food production. Um, there's all different kinds of energy, my imaginative energy, you could imagine having those instead of just single ones. Uh, living in the coastal areas of the Netherlands, it's very clear now that with the amounts of coastal intrusion, that a lot of the land is just simply not stable enough to build on. So as many of the architects have said, water is far more stable than soils that are thixotropic. So let's start building on water. And it's got the added benefit, of course, you do two things. One, you draw heat energy from the water. And two, when the storm comes, you can actually physically move the, move the houses to safer places. And that's precisely what happens now. There's a whole governance structure for that. And then there are these sort of landscapes that people dream up. But we see, we're beginning to see that, where you have almost enclosed areas in which people live, moving from one enclosed area to another, cutting down the amount of exposure they actually have to the real world. Not my cup of tea, but clearly some. Um, tackling food security. So th the typical response to food security is what the UN does very well, which is, of course, the World Food Program, which is to send out these packets of food which don't require any water, uh, literally can be stored, cut open, and given to children and, and the vulnerable particularly, but to families. Now, the challenge with these is that they're peanut, often they're peanut-based. So they have a, a reaction in many populations which is really um, re very, very negative. But on the other hand, we've got some other, other thing, things going on. It's not just about drought killing animals. We've also got toxins spreading through some of our crops. And one which is pernicious, which is, I think, surprising a lot, even in Europe, is the spread of aflatoxin. So aflatoxin has been known about for a long time. You often see spoilage in uh, warehouses where maize is retained and not looked after very well, particularly in developing countries. But it is really, really toxic. And I think when we produced this map, it came as a great shock to the European Union because they suddenly thought, no, 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 we, we, we don't do this. This is a developing world problem. But it turns out it isn't a developing world problem. Aflatoxin really likes the conditions that are now spreading up from Africa. And we can see on a number of occasions, it's already happened, but we can see again and again that even with modern ways of storage, the likelihood of aflatoxin contamination is going to increase. Now, the European Union takes this extremely seriously uh, because the contamination of the food chain has now been significantly linked to health disorders and, in particular, to liver cancer. So this is why aflatoxin is, is not just something esoteric that you might want to deal with in the Rice Institute or the Maize Institute in Mexico or somewhere else in, far, in, in, say, in Indonesia. No, 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 this is something which is very serious. And I go back to that point I made at the beginning. Even small doses, low dose exposures to aflatoxin can accumulate and start to create the basis for cancer. So I think that you know this is one of those aha moments, right, we better pay attention to this. We can't eradicate aflatoxin because of the, the speed at which it's spreading, it means that it's going to be extremely difficult. So we need to have aflatoxin testing, surveillance. We need to have different varieties that are maybe uh, resistant to it. But in the developing world, it's a really tricky problem. This is a, a small, well, not so small, but it's a neighborhood outside of uh, Nairobi called Dagoretti. And some public health officials went in just to see what the levels of aflatoxin poisoning were because they had been finding a couple of years ago that uh, people were, they were dying essentially all over Kenya. And so there was a recall of, of many, many, many of the food storage areas. The food was taken back. And then they went out into the community. And as you see here, when they did a simple testing of the children, 41% of the children were found to have aflatoxin poisoning. I mean, that's a huge number. And this is a big shock to the public health officials. And of course, it doesn't only lead to cancers. It leads to stunting, poor growth. Um, and pregnant women were, were taking this on board. So this is the staple diet. You can't just simply remove it and say, well, go and find an alternative. There's choice. Well, well, there is no choice. This is it. There is no other kind of staple food actually available. 
Um, so what's the answer? Well, one of the things that's come up is detection and monitoring, these little strips which you can now put out into the, into the wild, so to speak, and detect aflatoxins. So at least you can have public health officials very, very, in a very affordable way, being able to identify which food stores are contaminated. But then you still have the problem that if they're contaminated, what do you give people in, in its place? And of course, that's where the UN steps in and they bring their bags of rice and you know, we try to, try to see how to mitigate the direct problem. Crop diversity, there's a lot of work going on now amongst the uh, consultative group of international agricultural research centers, the CGIR, to look at what varieties they could grow. Let's just take one more step then down this road. And I'm using this as an example to show you how complex some of these systems can be. So climate change and childhood undernutrition. This is a map that's been put together and it's been used and been updated and so on, but it's about the vulnerability. And you can see, of course, that a lot of the world is very, very, is gonna be very susceptible in terms of climate change. And this vulnerability was um, life-threatening diseases, uh, malnutrition and undernutrition. When we look around the world, particularly in the developing countries, the DAC countries, we see that 46% is an enormous number of under fives is due to undernutrition. Okay, these are kind of sobering numbers. So half of all the children who die, die from undernutrition. Um, that's a lot of young lives are lost. But the one that's very worrying is the, the stunting and for the severe acute malnutrition. Now, the, the graph above was taken from a World Bank report, and it really just says that this is probably one of the most, it's the clearest case of where you need to invest. Because if you fix this problem and you invest, your return on investment is probably one of the highest that you'll get. So, you know, alert all aiding ag aid agencies. Please pay attention. It's the first 1,000 days that we have to focus on. Now, why is that? Well. In the first 1,000 days, children who are malnourished are really at risk for not developing their cognitive powers, their executive powers. Now, typically, when you see malnourishment and you see all the news and the television, that there are two types. There's the Kwashiorkor and the Marasmus. The Marasmus is actually more alarming. It looks terrible because the children are totally emaciated, have a swollen belly, but they look literally like they are on the verge of death. Whereas the Kwashiorkor children, as you can see on the left, they kind of look rather all right, you know, slightly rounded bodies and so on. Unfortunately, it is the Kwashiorkor children who have the potentially devastating effects because inside their organs are essentially melting down and their metabolic rates are just going out of the window. They cannot, their organs cannot cope with the malnutrition. Whereas the Marasmus child has, um, what I would say, uh, the sort of the ultimate control Yes, they're very, very thin, but all of their metabolic processes are intact. Their organs are functioning well, and although they look very emaciated, if you give them food, they rapidly get back onto the track and take off, whereas the Kwashi core is not quite so clear. But the most worrying is what happens to the brain development. And you can see the pictures in the middle. The uh, two top ones are children who have been malnourished, and the two bottom ones are the, are the healthy ones. And you can see many, many gaps and spaces in the brains, in the MRIs of the under and malnourished children. And in that first 1,000 days, you still have the opportunity to recover. You can still intervene. You can give micronutrients, you can give calories, and children can essentially be packed back in to a good development process for their cognition. If you miss that window, it all starts to go horribly wrong. And if they remain malnourished, certainly by the time children become adolescents, then what they do is they lose their cognitive executive, they lose their executive powers. And the clearest manifestation of that is uh, they're walking along, <laughs> someone hits them on the shoulder, and they have no possibility to maintain a calm response. It's almost like they will, they will absolutely reach out and react very violently. And this is, in a way, one of, the, one of the hallmarks of danger, I would say, is if you look at the map of malnutrition and you look at what I was doing, particularly when I was in the UN, thinking about the amount of internal displacement, people being moved into refugee camps, where the hallmark is calories, not necessarily nutrients, what you have are children that are potentially looking as if they're being fed, 
but they're not getting the food of the right quality that would enable them to have proper cognitive development. Now, just imagine where a lot of those people en end up. They start spreading out around the world. And what you have are young people, particularly, who have a very poor cognitive development with less executive power control than most of your average adolescents who've been brought up in a well-nourished setting. It's not their fault, but certainly it's something that we should be extremely careful and aware of. So, you know, you can ask the question, do you want to export the map of peace? In other words, treat children when they first arrive in a refugee camp with proper nutritious food and take care of that and focus on that? Or do you want to just sort of let it run, keep everyone alive, and then allow people just to either resettle back in their homes or to move out around the world? And I think we have a moral, there is a moral duty here, particularly for the UN, to make sure that this is taken care of. And in fact, that's what's beginning to happen. Can you repair cognitive damage? Well, that's one of the big questions. So it's a big question for the AI community. It's a big question for, for the deep learning community. Could you, in a sense, redo the calculus backwards and kind of go back to trying to reestablish what those cognitive networks, uh, the sort of neural networks would look like? Open question. I don't have any answers, but it's certainly an active part of research. Uh, by uh, quite a few people. <clears throat> so let me now conclude by where do I think there is resilience? Because that's all been very speculative and you know, sort of putting all the alarm bells up. But you know, all around the world, there are very, very resilient communities. They tend to be amongst some of the traditional communities. And so I've been looking over the years at, well, what is it? What's the hallmark that enables populations and communities who are confronted by the extremes of climate change and sometimes extremes of uh, socioeconomic, you know, going to the edge. And yet they have resilience and they actually do more than just exist. They thrive. They can really see themselves into the future. So when we talk about resilience and we think of well, where can we find success stories, I would very much tend to say, Let's go look at some of the indigenous peoples and the traditional peoples because they are facing uncertainty, but they've faced it for millennia, for decades. They really have a deep understanding of uncertainty. So the first place I'll take you is up to Greenland. I did a lot of work in Greenland um, when I was head of the Environment Agency. And it was a very interesting community because on the one hand, it's part of the kingdom of Denmark. So you have a slightly paternalistic background. The post is Danish. The currency is Danish, but everything else is Inuit, I can tell you, from beginning to end. Even to the point where East Greenland, they only have an oral language, and West Greenland it's written down. And they send all the orphans to the East, uh, so it's, it's a sort of slightly mixed up community. And yet, they take care, particularly of the children who are sent to them, to build a very different kind of life for them. And I'm going to take you sort of with Dinas, uh, who's shown in the picture there. So you've read all the stories about you know, the melting ice and how things are changing and so on and so forth. And it's, it's real, of course it is. They're seeing the very landscape they all grew up in changing right in front of them to the point where a lot of sea ice, the multi-year sea ice is gone. There's just the single sea ice. And these big icebergs that you see are probably 150, maybe 200,000 years old. And so you'll never see them again. And they're just carving off this enormous ice cap so it's about three kilometers thick, and in the fjords, these things float out, and that's it. It's quite good fun to go and get a piece of ice. I'm sure some of you have done it, and stick it in a glass with some whiskey or some alcohol, and then all the carbon dioxide fizzes and pops when it hits it. So you know, you're, you're, you're imbibing carbon dioxide from you know, at least 150,000 years ago, so it's quite, it's quite extraordinary. Anyway. The landscape is changing. It means that someone like Dinas, who has had dogs uh, for sledding, uh, for obviously, all his life, has really a very difficult decision because the dogs can't go out now for many of the months. And during the summer months, they're just chained up because they're, you know, they're vicious. I mean, they will they'll attack uh, and moving small things like children. So, you know, do you, do you get rid of the dogs? And that's a part of a way of life. So Dinas and others have taken a view across the, this uh, small settlement that they will have fewer dogs, um, but they will still retain them as part of their traditional life. Now, having dogs uh, requires many things, but at the other time of the year, they're seeing more and more people wanting to come and do tourism. 
So of course they're looking at how they can embed that into you know, their sort of daily lives and their traditions. But it's really dangerous. I mean, this is not an easy place to live. When you come to, let's say, the age of about 80 or so, um, and you feel that you're not going to be contributing to society anymore, this still happens. There is a rock that's just outside of the settlement, which is very, very steep, and it goes down straight into the fjord. And the elders who feel that they really can't contribute, particularly there's not enough food, and they think they'll be a burden to the family, they walk out onto the rock, and then they walk down into the fjord. So they, they essentially still give of themselves back to the community, knowing that if they stayed and there were too many in the village, they wouldn't make it. So as I say, even though they're part of Denmark, there are settlements which are, you, you just can't get to them. They're far, far, far away. And so they make these decisions in the middle of winter when they see that it's a choice between the elder and the, and the young children surviving. And that's community. I think that's one of these conversations that you know we, we, we had again and again whilst I was there. Um, but anyway, they have tourism now, and it's quite interesting because tourists who go there are quite adventuresome. And uh, oh yes, yes, we'd like to go out on a seal hunt, and you know, and then the, and then it happens in front of them, and the seals are absolutely for eating and for feeding to the dogs. <clears throat> So when Dinas, in this particular case, shot the seal, I thought I saw all the tourists go, oh, oh my God, it's, oh, it's real. Ah, right, oh, he, oh, he really did, oh, wow. Oh, yes, well, um, ha. Huh. But then what happened was absolutely extraordinary because Dinas got out of the boat, brought the seal up onto the ice, and said a prayer over the over the seal because it was a, it's always a very very it's a very special thing. So you know he may kill a seal every week, but it's still you know it's it's an ability that you you don't look down on at all. And I think that's what connected a lot of the tourists in the boat with this way of life. That this is genuinely part and parcel of how you live. The story behind this picture is, is a, it's actually, I, did, I didn't take it, it's a spectacular picture taken by a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. I was standing next to him, as was another person. I stood in exactly the same place as did the guy next to me. And he, he took the Pulitzer Prize picture, and I just took the ordinary one. I kept thinking, how does that happen? I'm in exactly the same place, you know. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. And this was on the front of the newspapers two days later. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, resilience. Those Inuit, um, I have to tell you, have both social, community, as well as adaptations in their lives that mean that they're probably going to be able to adapt for many, many decades to come, even in the face of extreme climate change. So now I'm going to switch to another community, entirely my own. Um, so two years ago, I got married to a chief in the Maasai. So this is where I live. I live in a mud hut in the Rift Valley, in a place called Iwangan. It's a village near to Sekanani, the Maasai Mara Reserve. Uh, there's a whole backstory to that one, which we won't do now, because uh, I'm going to talk about resilience, OK? But this is resilience as observed by me, scientist, chief scientist, tick, next to chief of village. So this is, this is kind of very interesting, because you know I'm the natural scientist, and he's the chief. But uh, I think we, we, he, he understands what I do. So sometimes I go into scientist mode, and I start recording things and doing all this sort of stuff. Oh, oh, she, oh it's Nasserian's doing that stuff now, right? OK. So um, it's a very, oh, it's just an amazing amazing landscape. Um, this is a really crappy picture, but anyway, it's a picture of the Rift Valley. Shortly after rain, so you can see it looks quite green. It's vast. It is the cradle of well, civilization, if you want to call it that, but certainly where humans are thought uh, to have at least evolved there, if not somewhere else. And um, it's a pretty extreme environment. And the Maasai are an iconic tribe. There are just uh, under, well, 648,000, as far as we can determine. They live all the way up the Rift Valley. They have slightly different language groups as you go up, but essentially they have the same traditions and the same way in which they live and structure society. And they've lived there for millennia. Um, it's a life which is entirely around animals, cattle primarily. Um, sheep and goats sort of play a, play a bit parts. You know, they come in and go out, come in and go out. But cattle are the mainstay. And semi-nomadic, which means that they'll settle and move every, every 10 years, 5 to 10 years, depending on the conditions. And it all relies on having open lands, Maasai lands, where people can move around. This is one of the warriors in my village. His English name is Michael. 
Mike, and he's wearing here the headdress with the ostrich feathers and so on, which marks him out as being the second bravest warrior in the village. And my husband was the bravest warrior, so he gets to wear <laughs> the lion. <laughs> anyway, so here they are. <clears throat> These are the warriors. Um, so on the left are some of the Morans with my husband. And these Morans are very interesting. These ones came from Tanzania. So they travel long, long distances. And in Tanzania, they still go out in the bush for six years. What did they learn? Well, they learn about each other. So the men in this period, so now we, we keep them at school and then they will go out into the bush. But essentially, they form a brotherhood. And there can be up to 100 that go into the bush. And in that time, they learn every single tree, bush, plant, what it will do to you, how it can save your life, and so on. Now, some of these plants make them very belligerent, I can tell you, and so they try to kill each other. So we send elders out to stop them killing each other, and then they kind of fight, and they do various things, and um, they, they come back then with many, many attributes. One is a level of tolerance of each other, understanding everyone's shortcomings, their good characteristics and their bad characteristics. They come back with an understanding, a deep understanding of nature, of wildlife, of course, because you're living right next to all the wildlife, lions, buffalo, elephants, really dangerous things, and you learn how to protect yourself. And they do that through a process of singing and eating certain herbs, which gives out an odor, which keeps quite a lot of animals away. They also learn discipline, tremendously disciplined, and then they learn probably the most important attribute, which is their job is to protect the community. And they will stand in the face of any danger that comes towards the community without thought. And so the hallmark when they come back in is, yes, they're now allowed to get married. Um, they can settle, but they're fearless. They simply do not have fear because they confront death all the time. And for them, it's now a matter of if it happens, it happens. But they're just literally, they're the most fearless team group of people I've ever met. And it's quite extraordinary what that does to a society. Now, meanwhile, here are the ladies, <coughs> my ladies, and they all work very, very hard, um, build the houses, look after the children, and, and make jewelry, of course, and generally sort of take care of the homestead, as you might call it. None of the ladies in my village had gone to school, not one of them. They could only speak Ma, so they don't read or write or anything like that. However, they're pretty smart, and the men are probably the smartest I can meet. So here are our elders. These are the ones who actually live in the village. The gentleman in the middle is uh, just over 100. Um, the one to the left is about, uh, I think he's 102, we've estimated. So we've got accurate records for most of them. So the village is split into young children up to about the age of 15. The boys becoming circumcised then. There is no more female circumcision. Then they go in and become Morans and young warriors, and they become junior elders. And then if you're wise, you become an elder. But the age doesn't matter. It's the, it's the group that you're in. So if you're in the, in the group coming back from the bush, the ages may range from late 20s up to 60. But you all went out together, so that is actually the class, and you're associated with them. And if your wife gets married in, she becomes part of that age group or that class. So that's why the elders are, are as a group, you know, quite a long way away from the age of m many of the others. Here they're drinking soup. It was part of a meat, uh, meat camp. And yes, we do eat, we have blood and meat and soup made of herbs. Um, there isn't much food, I must admit. I mean, I try to get as much food into the village as I can, but uh, on the whole, they would, when I first arrived, they would eat maybe every other day, maybe every three days. And then they would eat maybe twice a month, eat meat. And all the rest of the time, it would be milk in the morning, milk in the evening, and some herbs made into a soup. Walk 20 kilometers, carry 20 kilo jugs of water, four kilometers back and forth. Phenomenally strong, really, really strong. Um, these are some more young warriors. So you can see they've all been fattened up. So that's one of the things. They get to eat a lot of food before they go out in the bush. And they eat the fat, and they eat the kidneys, and the liver, and absolutely everything. It's probably one of the most nutritious diets you can imagine. It's not cooked. It's eaten raw, literally as the animal is killed. And then off they go into the bush, and they start walking, and they meet everybody. So they map the landscape and understand how that works. 
Now, the young girls, so the young girls now go to school. They didn't when I first arrived, but they all go to school, and because the boys have become much more aware of what the effects of circumcision are, uh, they've started going to the girls' meetings saying, well, we'd actually rather like to marry girls who haven't been circumcised. And instantaneously, I can tell you, the girls all said, great, so we can stay at school and we can forget about all of that. And so literally, that's sometimes how you can change the whole sort of thinking of people between young people. So uh, it's already having a long, long tail effect where uh, some of the older ladies who used to do the cutting have come to me and said, we're really happy because we don't want to do that. We really are quite relieved we don't have to do that anymore. So this whole issue of you're not a woman if you're not circumcised, uh, circumcised is, is beginning to really, really just disappear, which is fantastic, I must admit. One thing about the children is um, that I've been doing some testing on is that they are phenomenally good at mathematics. Without any formal training or education, I can give them blind testing, and they have some of the best mathematical attributes that I have come across. They can do like the basics of a calculus without knowing they're doing it. They can do time dimensions without knowing they're doing it, and spatial calculations. And they don't know how they do it, but they certainly come up with the right answers. And I mean numerical answers, not just qualitative answers. It, it's, it's really extraordinary. So I, I have to say that if you're in education and you want to come and look at a, a mathematics, a core mathematics ability, you should come to our village. So this is the village. Um, and one of the things I did when I got there was I introduced technology because I certainly wasn't going to carry water four kilometers in both directions. No, 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 no. I tried a wheelbarrow for a couple of weeks. That was a disaster. The wheel fell off. Everybody laughed, so I won't do that anymore. So I went up in the mountains, and I found a, water, a sacred spring, talked to the elders. And so now we have water piped by solar up to a tank and then two kilometers of PPR piping into the back of the uh, village. And we also took out fires, because any of you who visited these houses will know you walk in there and it's like living in a bonfire. It's just horrible f I mean, smoke and so on. So we've redesigned the Maasai house to not have a fire inside, have a small Jiko, and that has had immediate effects on the health of everybody. The levels of emphysema, asthma, flus, colds has just literally plummeted, and I took a lot of care to do um, some public health uh, surveys and so on, and it is really obvious that it has this huge impact straight away. Um, yeah, so the water is there, it's free, so of course, you know, you do have this calculus, oh, well, are people going to misuse it, but they don't. So, and we have, we provide water, and now it's clean water, so that's the other good benefit, is that now there are very few cases of typhoid or any other waterborne diseases. So, when I think about aid, and I think about development, and I think about all these elements building into resilience, one of them is health. And if you can tackle the basics, you have the chance to really see people thriving. And so water, electricity, I put solar in so there's now lights in the houses so children can read and you know, pe people can sort of be awake uh, later in the night than six o'clock. Uh, it, it really does transform. And it brings the community very close together. So that's being replicated across the whole of the Maasai nation. Um, and that's really good. And then now alternative and addition, different kinds of uh, foods. So honey, very important. Uh, it keeps the elephants away. Uh, it's dangerous. I got stung rather badly the first time, 234 stings, oh my God, um, with African bees. Not brilliant. However, honey has got huge nutritional value for the children. So this is all grown to supplement the diet of the children. And similarly, what we're also doing is we're now distributing plants and seeds to villages all around of medicinal trees. The idea is to plant a million trees, but not just for climate adaptation, but also for their use in medicine. So here's Jack, he's he together with some of the ladies, the lady who's there, the older one. They are, they know everything about the plants. So we've described 360 plants, the bioactive molecules, and we now know how they're used very traditionally for all kinds of diseases from STDs all the way through. And we probably have got uh, certainly a, a good antibiotic, a natural antibiotic, um, a derivative of periwinkle. So there are known equivalents, but what's fantastic that these are highly potent. And so here's an interesting fact. 
I've been comparing some of these plants to the collections in Kew because it turns out that climate change is inducing changes in the plants whereby they're concentrating the bioactive molecules in the bark and in the roots. And in some cases, there's almost a tenfold increase in the concentrations compared to plants from even 30, 40 years ago. That's, a, that's an amazing physiological response. So I'm hoping that we can publish that research and really, really look into that in more depth. But we're not just standing still in terms of living in the village. It's obvious when you come to a community like this where there is no money, and I really mean no money, zero money, that to be about in the world, you need to have something. And the World Bank and others talk about the dollar a day and the poverty level and so on. But actually, it's nothing to do with that. If you want to thrive, what, what, if you give a Maasai money, the first thing they will do is get a smartphone and buy airtime. And they spend all their time talking to each other. Now, I told you the ladies are, were illiterate. All of the ladies in the, in the village take classes to learn to read and write because they want to message. They want to message because they realize, A, you can talk to the hospital, you can get help. You can talk to your family who are hundreds of kilometers away. It's, it's a phenomenal thing. And they, don't, they can't be bothered with all the other sort of stuff on there. I mean, there's Wi-Fi in the village because I, I needed it. But that's not where they use it. No, that's not, I need it to get my satellite pictures. But they, they use it for three things. So Patrick, my husband, uses it to download as many traditional films and old films of all the traditions because there are events that only happen once in a lifetime. So the children come into the house and they watch these old sort of ceremonies that will never be seen by them, almost certainly, because they maybe happen every hundred years. And so he can teach them using these. And the children love it. I mean, of course, they're singing in Maasai and so on. The ladies use it to chatter, of course, but, but it's really lovely. And, and the men, of course. The men are busy doing nothing, but usually they're chatting to each other all the time. But they're always scanning the horizon, you know, for wild animals and stuff. But anyway, I took a group of ladies who were completely illiterate, and I built this waste incinerator because there was a lot of waste blowing around, plastics and so on. And I, put, I inserted this. It's, a, it's the only solar incinerator in Africa, put in absolutely oodles of solar power. And then I took the ladies, took six of them. We now have 30 staff employed and taught them how to run this very, very complicated piece of machinery, I have to say, with dials and everything else. Within five days, they had it down pat. They understood the numbers, the dials, the thresholds, when to open the incinerator, and so on and so forth. And they are able to take home a small salary. But the great thing about it is that they use it immediately to pay school fees. That's what they use the money for. So for them, they see the future in children being able to go to school and then staying in the Maasai because now there are proper jobs. And that really is the hallmark of resilience, is that you adapt your culture. You don't lose any of it. You don't lose any of the kind of having meat camps, going in the bush, doing all of that, particularly if elders value it. But at the same time, you're really, really able to connect to modern society. And I think that's, for me, the hallmark of resilience. So yes, we still have the Unoto. Well, there will be one this year, which is when all the young men go out. And this is the picture of the last one, which was um, uh, 32 years ago, but we do it absolutely embedded in nature. So thank you very much. Thank you.